But um, this session, uh, session two, can America's small businesses carry the middle class? You'll see that we've already engaged on many of the themes um, that we hope to cover in this session. When we were thinking about our second summit, we really realized that, uh, as I think Gene Sterling said, or somebody in the last panel, you really can't get to theories about rebuilding household balance sheets without looking at what's driving wages and who's paying those wages. And I love the fact that we, we could basically have touched on the entire agenda already. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's great. It just means that everybody's ready for this conversation. Um, so, but uh, we are very thankful to have Rhett Bottle and Neera Tandon and uh, Jim Petakoukas with us. David Walker's plane got delayed, uh, so he is not with us. So we're going to switch, and I'm going to moderate so that Jim can play a larger role in uh, responding to some of the thinking in this, in this panel. So um, I am just going to to start off, I am very thankful that Rhett came and that we have Small Business Majority with us. And I know that you introduced yourself as being somewhat new to the financial security conversation. Um, but I think uh, you're not new at all to the challenge of depicting and showing where small businesses are. And I think at many points in the conversation about retirement security or financial security, somebody throws up their hands and says, you know, well, if we can't move the employers, particularly the small uh, businesses, we can't do anything. And I think we hit some of those echoes today. So start out, Rhett, by defining small business for us and, and giving a brief sense of how you at small business um, uh, majority define your work. Give us a little bit of the shape of how many Americans work. Give us our cliff notes. Um, and then give us a sense of, of how your members describe their financial security challenge or their big challenge, so. Sure. Well, I first want to note that I think the, the title of the session is Can America's Small Business Carry the Middle Class? Yeah, and well, the answer, of course, is yes. And I wouldn't, be, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't answer that succinctly and that clearly. And, and I know that um, Nira and I, who've done a lot of work together around healthcare issues, uh, Nira is a big champion of, of small business and small business having a voice at the public policy table. So I'm excited that we're going to have this conversation. Um, just quickly, a little bit about uh, about small business, and it was really interesting to hear the conversation, you know, before hear folks talk about sort of employers, um, and, and I think it's really important that when we're talking about employment, to make sure that we are specifically breaking that down and talking about large employers, medium employers, and and also small employers, and obviously the piece which we do at Small Business Majority um, is focused on on the small business piece and the small um, employer piece. One of the reasons our organization was founded was because we felt like a lot of the conversation around <laughs> small business in the public policy arena wasn't really accurately reflected. We've, uh, what I'd like to say is pioneered this really, what I think is key model in that we do a lot of scientific opinion polling of research. So while we have folks who belong to our organization and we work with vast business networks, all of our public policy is driven by research. So we actually go out and we do polling of small businesses. And we've done this across a variety of public policy issues, healthcare actually being our largest issue, but energy access to capital issues. Um, and we're hoping to do some uh, in this space as well, the financial security space. And I think what's interesting to know is that, um, you know, everyone in Washington uh, says that they're a friend to small business. Um, <laughs> it's important uh, with a big political P and a small political P. Um, but what I found is that uh, most folks in Washington actually don't know much about small business. And um, we spend a lot of time just educating people about who small business owners are. And so just, you know, just a quick rundown on the community. Um, according to the U.S. Small Business Administration, there's 28 million small employers um, in this country. Uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration defines small business as 500 employees and under. Uh, I'm not sure I would put the marker there, or many of us uh, would. Uh, the vast majority of those are, are truly 20 employees and under, so we're talking about very small employers. Um, it's important to know of those 28 million, 22 million of them are self-employed individuals. Now, those people may hire someone at some point in the year. They may hire a, you know, a contractor. They might hire a consultant. Uh, but generally, you know, these are people who are self-employed individuals. And I always like to take a moment to stop and talk a little bit about the self-employed, because I think there's this image sometimes in America that the self-employed community are folks who are sitting at home in their bunny slippers selling stuff on eBay. And while that may be the case for some people, that is not the case for a lot of these people. A lot of these people are true entrepreneurs who you know, may, may decide that they just want to be self-employed for whatever reason. 
um, or at some point would like to expand and hire people and take on employees and make that decision. I think uh, in, in another important thing to know about the small business community and, and in, in a lot of conversations we have with our colleagues at ARP is that the vast majority of uh, folks who start businesses in this country are in the 50 plus um, age range. And so there's a huge overlap when we are talking about retirement security, um, not only uh, from the business perspective and the, the employee perspective, but also that the employers who are starting these businesses uh, are also very much thinking about their own financial security and their own retirement security. So I think the two big points I wanted to make to sort of start off the conversation is one, I think we need to do uh, much more digging about who the small business community is and really understand because size is very important. And as we talk about what are solutions around this, we have to think, uh, we really have to tailor the solutions by size. I do, you know, everything we hear from employers, whether it's healthcare or any set of benefits, all of them do want to offer <coughs> benefits to their employees and pay good wages. Um, and generally, that's, it's a matter of economic competitiveness. They want to be competitive not only with small employers, but also large employers. And benefits are a big part of that. Uh, but I think we also have to understand that uh, when we create smart public policy, we have to make sure that we're, uh, we're providing some safe harbors for the smallest employers who are getting off the ground, who may eventually at some point be a much larger <coughs> employer who can contribute in that way. So I'm interested uh, to, to have some more conversation about that. And I think we touched a little bit upon that earlier. And then I think the second um, point that I just didn't want to leave uh, uh, was the role of government. Um, I think there has been uh, this perpetuation, particularly with the small business community, that the government should just get out of the way. We often hear, cut the red tape and the government should just get out of the way. Um, I would be the, uh, remiss to say that there aren't some dumb rules out there. Um, there's you know, some regulations that do hinder business. Um, but that is not what we see in the research, and that is not what we hear from small businesses. And I think, uh, like we heard from the congressman, making blanket statements like that um, are not only um, harmful to, obviously, uh, the conversation that we're trying to have around uh, general good public policy for all of American society, but it's, um, it's harmful to creating a, um, a system for uh, good entrepreneurship. And we often hear from um, small businesses that there is a positive role that the government can play in leveling the playing field. <coughs> Um, and uh, creating rules that allow them to be competitive uh, with, with much larger employers. So I'll stop there uh, with those two ideas. And well, Let me uh, push you a little more. So just to recap, the 28 million number is, is how many small businesses there are? 28 million are small employers, and that includes that self-employed population. So 6 million of those are folks who actually employ individuals. 22 million of them are self-employed. And then, so what does that say as an employment, as a job generator? Do we have numbers on... Um, what if if the twenty if the six million are employing others? What's the catch of that? Well, I think you know what what we are seeing and and what we're hearing from folks anecdotally, but I think we're also seeing this in the job numbers is that you know small business owners are are starting to feel more optimistic about the economy. They are starting um, to pick up hiring, um, and I think that you know creating an environment to sort of foster that is an important part of this conversation. Okay, so. We are going to, you know where this conversation wants to go. We are, we've already hit it. It wants to go to retirement. But before I bleed over into that side, which we're going to do nonstop tomorrow too, um, from your polling and your sign, what, what are the biggest challenges that, that you hear from your membership is facing? One of the, the biggest things we hear about, and I, I think it does play a role in this conversation, um, are, are two things. One is... Uh, the government being consistent. Um, I, I can't explain enough. I think it's hard for every individual American, but particularly for employers who, as we heard, generally tend to be more educated, make much more strategic decisions. Uh, the crises and crises that continues to happen in Washington, whether it's the fiscal cliff or uh, delays on important rules coming down, uh, that stuff really makes it difficult for businesses to plan for their future. And most business owners um, who've been around for a long time who are consistent employers, uh, that consistency is really important to them. So that's one thing we hear. And then the other, which is very related to this conversation, is access to capital. Uh, for, for folks who want to go out and start businesses, uh, the lending just hasn't been there um, the way that it has been um, in the past. Uh, we're, you know, I think uh, we're starting to see a lot more innovative models. Uh, Congress and the president, in actually a bipartisan fashion, uh, passed the JOBS Act this year. Uh, which a lot of folks are probably very familiar with the crowdfunding provision, which 
really I like to call the democratization of, of lending uh, because it's going to allow anyone who's interested in any business to invest. We're still waiting for the rules to come out on that. Um, but, you know, uh, access to capital is that lubrication and that um, capitalization for small businesses, making sure that the money is flowing um, is key to small business growth and hiring. Okay, so consistency, and I assume in regulatory and economic conditions and in access to capital. So, Rhett, you also made an interesting statement. You've said all of them want to do some benefits, which sounds almost too rosy. But I think this conversation also wants to look at adding more benefits. So give us your read on at least your view of your memberships on doing more benefits. If they're not, we also know that this is the field where lots of workers don't have at least an access to a savings a workplace either for short-term needs, credit unions, things that Michael Barr wrote about, or retirement things. So give, give us a sense of um, Areas where small businesses you see willing to provide more and, and where you see the roadblocks to that. I, I think this is an area where size is really important, as I was talking about before. Um, and, and one of the uh, examples that I want to relate to this, uh, Jeremy and I were actually talking out on the patio, and we were talking a lot about health care reform. And I think, you know, health care, while very different, and we talked a little bit about this when we were, when we were in Maryland, um, it draws a lot of parallels because a conversation around the employer mandate has been one of the most controversial <coughs> parts of the health care law. Um, many of you may have seen the news Tuesday when, when many of us were on vacation that the employer mandate's being delayed for a year by the Obama administration. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that health care reform did rather brilliantly was it provides incentives for small employers who do want to offer health insurance, and so it creates a pathway for folks who want to do that. <coughs> but at the same time, it also creates another pathway for small businesses who decide that they don't want to do that to make sure that their employees can still get um, affordable and accessible health care coverage. And the challenge has been communicating that to small employers because of all of the decisive rhetoric around it. Small employers are still very confused about that. Even though the vast majority, 96% under the health care law, are actually completely exempt from offering coverage, the vast majority still think that they have to do so. And we've spent years out there talking to people and doing things, um, and it's still taking a long time. And I think it relates to this situation because I don't think one answer um, uh, fits every employer. I think we have to look at a system, particularly by size, that's going to create incentives for some small employers who do want to play you know, have skin in the game, and they do want to contribute. But I also think we also need to have a conversation about um, employers who, particularly because of their size, uh, more than any reason, just aren't going to be able to offer more benefits. And what pathways can we create for those Americans who work for those small employers? Do you want to take on any sense, Rhett, of if you had your wishing, if you had your wand, uh, what roadblock you would take out of those who did want to Let's give you the larger size, over 10, over 15, over 20. What would you get out of the way so that it would be easier to offer more benefits? Oh, I think that's difficult. I think, you know, I, th I think that's a challenge. I think, um, you know, I, I think there are some tax incentives that we could put in place um, if we did those in a clear uh, way that was consistent that could encourage employers to want to more play ball in this area, particularly small employers want to more play ball in this area. I do, I, I do want to mention, though, I, did, I do hear folks on the, on the regulatory piece of this, and you know, we have heard from a lot of folks who are interested, in, particularly in retirement benefits, that uh, the fiduciary responsibility is of key concern to them. Okay, so we're going to come back there. Nira, I want to come to you. You heard uh, interesting questions, uh, interesting discussion at the earlier about wage levels, about the challenge that this presents to the savings and investing. But if we look not just at the dollar amount of a wage, where, where has CAP been? What other supports have you been looking at that should come with a wage that are largely now missing in the, in the workplace benefit package today? We, we use the shorthand wage plus. Uh, right. You know, what else is, what have you been talking about, about the... Um. So, you know, I think overall, uh, I think we, sh we are deeply concerned with the, the deep 
pressure on wages in the U.S., uh, not just in the U.S., it's happening to developed countries around the world, but uh, it's, there is a particular struggle in the U.S., and as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a, a deep anxiety that we've had productivity increases and still wage declines, um, and that that's, and I think in, in some serious sense, in a country which is still 70% demand-driven, is having is part of the deep challenge we face in the economy. As people's wages are pressured and they can't consume, um, and we're still a very consumption-oriented economy. So, uh, having having said that, you know we don't we don't believe that the only way to address that is to sort of ignore the issue of benefits. Um, in in fact, from our perspective, I mean, obviously we're focused on issues like retirement security, but we'd like to. We like to broaden the concept of financial security to issues that are perhaps not discussed all the time. Um, so for us uh, and uh, for, for my work in particular, uh, we've been particularly focused on issues around paid leave. Um, we believe that those are critically, those are critical issues not only for uh, the benefits to the worker, but actually for long-term competitiveness. And we know that there's the zero to three age is critical for brain development, and that people who kids who come, who are who come prepared, better prepared to learn, are better off. And so, and it is the case that the United States is one of a small handful of countries that don't offer paid leave. Now, obviously, in the small business context, that is a particularly tough issue. Um, uh, in the larger business context, you know, uh, there are lots of arguments that are, are raised. Um, but as was noted earlier, you know, we have com companies that are sitting on trillions of dollars of cash. Um, and so I am not heavily persuaded by uh, the, the issues around, um, you know, employer costs for large companies. I mean, I have a very a kind of cynical view, which is that most of the jobs that have been outsourced have been, can be outsourced, have been outsourced, and that we shouldn't be in this zero-sum game, that we should be adding benefits. Um, especially where uh, many other countries are. So I'd say p paid leave is a particular area that we're focused on that is, uh, we believe is critical to financial security. Uh, and you know, when you look at issues of equity, it is a particular challenge for women that and has been a big challenge for women's advance that they have to come out of the workforce for periods of time, which has lowered their wages, their average wages when they come back into the workforce. Um, that's also lowered the earnings of their families. Uh, and so having a continuum where they don't, they're not punished for being parents uh, in their economic conditions seems to me a policy that uh, helps make people more productive over the long term is a good policy for all of us. You know, I'd be open to ideas of how to uh, spread the costs <coughs> around paid leave. Um, we would note that most employers are who've gone through, pay, who are living through paid leave today, uh, don't see big challenges with it. So that's one area where I expand. Right, expand a bit. But are you deliberately taking the small businesses out of the equation of the paid leave? No, I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't sanction taking them. I, I, think, I do think there are harder <laughs> conversations about costs and cost allocations. You don't want to have a system where small businesses are choosing not to hire young women. You know, there are, uh, there are, there's some data from Europe that paid leave policies that are, are frankly much longer than anyone consider in the U.S., like a year-long um, policies, are having a negative impact on, on workers, on hiring of women workers. So I, I, we, we wouldn't take small business out of that okay. context. But I do note that those challenges are bigger than they are in, amongst the larger employers. I mean, I would say on the, the one, one point I'd like to make that's separate, that, um, that I think maybe loops in this conversation and the earlier conversation is, you know, I think the preconceived notion of policymakers has been that the model is, model of employment is the large employer with, you know, relatively rich benefits. And then the small business, uh, then you have small business and independent contractors and, you know, where there are just fewer and fewer benefits. And it seems to me that over the last uh, you know, several decades, we've kind of moved to a model where benefits are less and less consumed because we're, <laughs> we have just so many more independent contractors 
and, and small business owners. And so I think the real big question for public policy is how do you scoop in more of small business and uh, independent contractors into the existing benefits we have? The, affordable, the theory of the Affordable Care Act, the theory of the exchange, was to actually permit uh, or was to allow small businesses to have the same negotiating power as large businesses and thereby bring in, I mean, and also with the tax credits and the individual mandate, bring in health insurance coverage. So health insurance coverage would no longer be one of the decision points between small business and large business employment from the individual perspective. And I think we have to, and that system is not perfect, but <laughs> that was the theory of the system. And I think, you know, we are, it seems to me like writ large, uh, you're seeing employers, <coughs> large employers drop coverage, the forms of benefits moving. Writ large, the, the engine is going the opposite way. It's not like big employers are bringing everyone up. It's that independent contractors and small businesses are creating, uh, and global trade, a variety of other issues, are creating more and more acceptance of limiting those benefits. Limiting. So unless we think of a manner by which we bring <coughs> benefits into the into the new new versions of employment or the employment into independent contracting, et cetera, we're going to be in a system where there's always going to be this trade-off for the large employer and they'll be more and more open to heading back on these these benefits that are so important. Yeah. You used, I'm going to get to Jim too, but you used an interesting phrase when you said uh, maybe the time of outsourcing, we've outsourced as far as we could go, and maybe it's time to add benefits back. Mm -hmm. What gives you some hope that there is a way to add benefits back to kind of get, you kind of described an eloquent picture of the dragging <laughs> down. Well, I, you know, I don't but, think that's like a good thing. You know, it's like I'm not, I'm not advocating. Um, I'm not advocating. I mean, we do, we're in this very odd picture, right, where and we have big challenges with employment. We have big challenges with wages. Companies are pretty wealthy, you know, so <laughs> it seems... Uh, I think the the whole nature. I mean, it's it's the fact that we that we have the unemployment rate where it is means that we're not going to just naturally have increases in benefits from the structure of the labor market, right? You know, that might happen. It's not 3%. happening. It's not happening. It's not happening inexorably, yeah. right? Yeah. Because there's not the competition. There's not the labor competition to make people compete on benefits. If anything, you know, the <coughs> fact that the, the jobs that are getting replaced are lower wage jobs. The jobs that are that were lost in the recession is only going the other way, which makes, in my mind, you know. But of course, I'm progressive. Makes <laughs> in my mind that the impetus on policy, government policy, has to be higher because otherwise, there's no other pressure that's going to create course. this benefit, and we don't want to. And you know, to to uh, my own view is that in the end, we have. You know, I don't think of this as a as a partisan issue. We all have an interest in in increasing demand in the economy. I I think business leaders have, you know, but Democrats, Republicans, we are fa we've been facing this demand challenge for years now, and it seems to me like we have there's some optimism about things moving in the right direction, but we still have deep deep problems of very unequal growth, which are hurting the demand side of the equation. And so both through benefits and other mechanisms, we want people to feel enough security so that they can, you know, so that it's not hurting demand. Do more. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully I would like it to go into savings as well, but I understand how someone who's basically like, <coughs> you know, just using up their savings to stay even uh, isn't going to make that. Change. Have a hard time. Good. Jim, I'm going to bring you in. I want you to tell me whether you agree with Nira's assessment. She's got an interesting equation going on about how Are you trying to set up an AEI CAP fight with your, very, your, I with your initial really question? Well with You're creating work, conflict so with your initial question? I think we can end it with just the children and how I'm nicer to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they would probably agree we'll have to that. They would be in 40 years to see what's actually happening. Um, but um, Jim, though, do you agree with the assessment? And, and I think she starts with a really interesting point. 
if we're demand challenged, if we still need, then we need jobs that are got some of these benefits back and the teeter totters unweighted in the labor market and you need to come in with more policy. So what's your, what's your equation? Well, one thing I write a lot about is, I write a lot about this recovery and how, how weak it's been. And the one thing, and we can talk about the unemployment rate's too high and what's been going on with the wages, but the one thing that sort of really concerned me is, is what's been going on with small business and particularly startups. Is that really over the past 30 years, we've seen a decline uh, in startups, particularly over during this recovery. Uh, and to me, that, listen, this came up in the, uh, the panel last night, this, and it came up in the previous panel. We knew we need faster economic growth, faster economic growth. Uh, it doesn't solve every problem, but it makes a lot of problems easier from wages to dealing with, uh, dealing with debt. Initially, this is, uh, uh, Dave Walker is supposed to be here, and I was supposed to be moderating this, so I'd like to do a little David Dave Walker. Walker. Uh, <laughs> We've got to worry about the deficit. It'd be great if we get it on some sort of 20-year uh, downward slope here sooner, sooner rather than later. So well. If I had to throw that in there, at least. Uh, yeah. But, but I'm concerned that something, and we can talk about you know, what that is exactly, that something has sort of gone wrong uh, with small businesses, and particularly startup small businesses, which I think are incredibly important going forward uh, for not, not just creating the sort of innovation for the economy, but creating the sort of new source of jobs, new kinds of business models that will help people deal. Uh, you know, we mentioned, um, to mention outsourcing, that you know, maybe the outsourcing is over. Well, maybe the outsourcing may be over to Asia, but it's not over to robot land. Yeah, yeah. Jobs will That's continue to be outsourced to robot land. Oh, yeah. and, and innovation not only creates these sorts of new technologies, but also creates a solution to dealing with that by, again, coming up with new businesses, different ways people can use technology. So, I, so I'm, I'm concerned about where sort of the, the startup, which is really, I think, the heart of the U.S. economy is right now, and then, this, and then to say that, well, you know what, we need them to start offering more benefits. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's, that's exactly the right prescription right now. I mean, I, ideally, I, mean, I, would, I would like businesses out of the healthcare business. Uh, I would I'd like, you know, you just be able to go, uh, you know, perhaps with a government subsidy and buy, and buy insurance on, on the private market. So I prefer government businesses not uh, being that, and who knows, with this employer mandate, that's maybe the direction we're going. Uh, so that's, that's my big. That's sort of my big concern with the general topic is that that the that the core, um, you know, driving force of the U.S. economy it, to me is in trouble. And I'm and I think it came up here. I mean, we were talking about it's challenging uh, to give them benefits. Yeah, it's, this is this is very challenging uh, for them to offer new benefits. I'm, I, and I'm wondering if it's an insurmountable challenge to say that right you know right now. Here's what we need to do. We need to be at need to be offering offering. Uh, retirement plans, uh, gr you know, greater, uh, greater leave. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps, I mean, maybe the better solution is to have, and, and, and we've talked a bit about, you know, about uh, automatic enrollment for 401k plans or IRAs, uh, which I think is a fantastic idea. Uh, AEI, we don't really do sort of like this is AEI's position, uh, but certainly there's a lot of scholars there. Uh, certainly it's not unanimous that think that's a really good idea, that, that, that it's a, that'd be a great idea for businesses uh, to automatically enroll, uh, you know, with you know, with an opt out, but you know, sort of behavioral analysis, give give employees that nudge uh, uh, to start up with four hundred one k plan. Do I think that needs to be at a business, you know, of under you know, fifty employees? Uh, no, I think for I think for those small businesses, I'd rather it be uh, the four hundred one k, maybe some sort of universal four hundred one k. We can talk about how to finance it uh, outside the business, and that not actually be a business mandated, mandated benefit. So I would just, as we sort of go on with this conversation, I would just be very careful about, uh, what sort of new mandates or regulations we want to put on a sector of the economy, which is extraordinarily important, but I think might also be in a bit of trouble. So can I ask you just from your understanding, I'd love to just understand why, I mean, obviously today we don't have any requirements on startups in terms of benefits. So why are we, given that that doesn't exist, why are we seeing, what are you, what's your analysis as to why we're seeing the problem or the, the sort of slowdown in startup? You know, uh, I, no, and I wasn't trying to create a causality. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, no, I'm taking it as I know, I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure. You know, is, 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 it, is it healthcare costs? Uh, is it the fact that we've had a, you know, a, a too big to fail banking system, which is sort of incentivized banks to make, to make loans in areas uh, which would be of concern to the Fed. They have a lot of macro risk, but the, those those exact kind of loans are also the kind of things that potentially, the, and they don't do as much venture. small business lending. Venture capital, VC funds are down 10% from last year. Um, 
so I, you know, uh, you know, we mentioned actually mentioned a great Wall Street Journal article in a previous panel from uh, maybe about a month ago about less risk taking in society. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure there was a consensus answer. Could it be? You know, there's been a huge rise in, you know, licensing requirements um, for people starting up small businesses. And, you know, it's, there's been a, a huge increase. So, I, so I'm not sure. I don't have I don't have a magic answer. Is in fact we're just an older society. But then we also mentioned a lot of seniors are starting businesses. I'm not sure that's a perfect answer. Uh, but, it, but but I am concerned though. I don't yeah, I don't, I I don't mean, have a and, and uh, Red, yeah, why don't you try to, to answer? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll just I, I think it very much relate, or at least what we hear is that it very much relates to access to capital. And I think you know one of the things uh, that we have taken for granted is probably the severity, or maybe we haven't, the severity of the housing crisis and how many business owners uh, put their houses up when they go to start their business, um, and all of that capital is gone, and that they haven't been able to do that. I I also think you know. As much as I think we've done a good job of, of helping businesses provide support, I think there has been a lack of a focus also on Main Street. Um, so much of the, the focus on incentives has gone towards this, how do we create, uh, create the next Facebook? And I think that that's really important, but every small business isn't going to be Facebook. Um, we also have to recognize that small businesses that line Main Street are very important. In fact, critical to local economies. They tend to, you know, keep their money 70 more times in local economies. So I think, you, you know, when the when the government's thinking about how to make investments, I think so much of it over the last few years has been, you know, how do we uh, help these high tech startups get off the ground? Because that's going to add, you know, so many jobs more quickly. And I think that's an important conversation. But I think we also have to pay attention to Main Street too. That's us. it's like, but right. I mean, I right. We, we need you know what they you know what they call the gazelles. We need these fast these companies are going to be fast growing. They're going to go from small companies to big companies. Fantastic. Uh, you know, but obviously we also need people. I mean, that's one that I talk about saving. I think one of the best ways more of us are going to become small business owners in the future. Uh, so I think to make it easier. Uh, I mean, we did a great event on the on, on Uber. You know, yep. I, you know, a perfect example of a business starting. Yep. Where yet. There was yet yet there was this regu regulatory pushback to quash it. Um, not everything is quite you know as sexy as that story, uh, but it, it's a million of those sort of little things which I think may be which may be dragging uh, on on small business creation. Yeah. Uh, what, Jim, can uh, I can I pop in again, Jim? I want to go back to your phrase about sort of I'd like the small business community to be out of the business of healthcare. Do you feel the same on retirement? We had we had echoes of that in the prior conversation. You know. Why is the widget manager responsible for uh, the person who's trying to make something responsible for <laughs> investing her employees' uh, future retirement? Uh, what, what's your reaction? Well, right, to that? there was some of that in that panel. Um, you know, do we want to keep these? You know, to what extent do we want to have businesses involved? Because that's not, you know, if you're making, you're making, you know, you know widgets or you're uh, a retailer. You know, um, those benefits aren't. You know, that that's not that's not your core <laughs> business. Uh, I, I think I think using business as as, as sort of a distributor, distributor. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that I think that's a good idea. And again, I have I I think it's probably a very good idea to to, to, to sort of nudge people into these plans. I realize, uh, I, you know, coming you know coming out of the last election, uh, one of the things I've tried to think about, and a lot of people at AI have tried to think about, is uh, you know you know what you know what is the what is a economic agenda that doesn't throw away kinds of things that sort of center right folks have been talking about, you know. Uh, we need, you know, we need more entrepreneurs, but also more directly addressing sort of middle class uh, problems. And I, th and I think, I, and I realize the idea mm -hmm. of a mandate, uh, that word is, you know, sort of, you know, nuclear and radioactive. Uh, but I think, I, th I think that, but I think that, I think this is an issue where that can be overcome, uh, where, where, where I, I, can, I can see that, you know, maybe not right now, but, you know, in my lifetime, uh, and as I tell my kids, I, I maybe got five good years left. So this could, so this sooner rather than later, this is not like you know, 50 years from now. Uh, they, Do they realize that this means like, they have to work now? The tithing program starts soon. I hope you have more than five years. But Let's finish your sentence because you're on something big here. Uh, we, we, you can see sort of folks on the center right really embracing that, that kind of mandate. Say it again. Uh, especially because if there was some sort of, you know, there was an opt out. Uh, but, but initially just, you know, automatically enrolling people in those kinds of funds, I think, is, you know, is a, is a very good idea. Do you have a reaction to that, Red? What I think he was, it starts to sound very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, An economic agenda that doesn't throw away what's working, but yet 
brings more. I can't. I didn't yeah. get your final. It, th there's one piece too. I just want to lay on the table quickly. Is is also I, I'm very concerned about the amount of young people starting businesses, and I think uh, student debt has a large role to play in that. But we can table that and maybe uh, come back to it. it. You know, I hate to go back to to the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act tries to achieve exactly what you've said, which is that you know the mandate, as I said before, for small employers is at 50 employees. 96% of all businesses uh, don't even, you know, completely aren't touched by that mandate. Um, and the vast majority who are already offer coverage. It's approximately 210 businesses, uh, 210,000 businesses which are affected by the employer mandate. Yet we're seeing the administration delay for a year because of all the political pushback that they've gotten from the business community, even though we're talking about a very, very small amount. So I, while I, I agree with your I sort of I agree with your thought. I think we have to sort of do this in two ways, which is you know uh, provide incentives for employers who want to do so, um, but also provide another avenue, whether that's you know auto enrolling and nudging. Um, there's got to be an individual piece. I think there has to be an employer piece as well. Uh, I'm nervous about the political ramifications just with you know the challenges we're having getting the mandates implemented um, on the healthcare piece, which quite frankly, healthcare tends to be more near and dear to people. They tend to have a more sort of uh, better understanding of it than, than sort of financial security issues. Nira? So, I mean, I, I wanted to return to one thing, which is this issue of, um, of why we're having fewer startups. And, I, and I, I think, you know, I think perhaps this whole conversation relates. Um, you know, one thing we're looking at, at is, the levels of innovation in, in Nordic countries, which is actually relatively high, right? Um, and, uh, and I think that actually one of the challenges we have in this economy is that, you know, if you make one false move for, you know, large sections of the economy, like your life goes on and it can go on a downward spiral relatively quickly. It can be healthcare, it could be like you bought the wrong house, you know. It could be an accident of some kind. And so I actually, you know, I do think the issue of startups is a vitally important issue. Um, and if we have uh, fewer startups, that is a big challenge. But I actually would relate it to the question around benefits and wages, which is that, you know, in in the world, if you if all these dis if you don't have a infrastructure of support and some terrible thing happens or you decide you want to go do a company and it fails right because most fail like you have to believe you could fail to do a startup right then it's going to be a hard it's going to be a harder decision to make to do and so um you know i don't know that necessarily that this is the reason why we have fewer startups or less innovation, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the fact that fewer co companies are offering benefits, that you know, the, whole state, the whole suite of support is going in the opposite direction. Doesn't, a rational thinker doesn't think, like, maybe I should do this 10 years from now when I have more wealth in my home or my home is more stable or my assets are more stable than doing it now. And so I completely appreciate the question of putting benefits on the startup, right? But that doesn't mean, I think the startup is like one example over here, and we have small businesses and other examples where, you know, large employers aren't offering paid leave, for example, where, you know, that we sh I think we should think seriously on the other side of the question. I'm going to give Jim and Rhett final comments, and then we're going to, I see some other signs starting to pop up, and then we're going to open the table. So, Jim, reaction to uh, Nira or another point? Well, I mean, I mean, I don't know where the exact cutoff should be, uh, whether it's 50 employees, 100, uh, or 500. But in all the polls that you guys have taken, when, I mean, is there a, when they talk, when, when business talk about their big concerns, you know, the taxes, the regulation, I mean, where in that, where, where in that ranking is their big concern, our inability to offer more benefits? Are you asking is that, their is employees? It, yeah, is that, yeah. that might be someone Employers, to ask too. I mean, right. <laughs> no, 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 I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's been, you know, if that is something that we've asked in our survey, something we should. Um, I think, but I, but I, I reject the notion that employers don't think it's important to, empl to provide their employees benefits. I don't think that's what you're saying, but I just, I think that they do think it's important. I think that they do want to. I think they can't for a variety of factors. I think a lot of it relates to size. 
You don't really start getting an HR manager until you're about 10, 15, maybe even 20 people. Uh, you're just trying to keep the doors open when you're five people. I think most sort of reasonable you know, policy folks who we talk to understand that we have to create some safe harbors for business. But at some point, I do think employers are willing to step up to the plate and be responsible um, and, and commit to that. And we saw that, uh, we saw that in healthcare. As much as it got, uh, unfortunately, politicized, we did see a lot of employers step forward and say, I appreciate you creating this marketplace. I do want to have a place uh, uh, to shop like a large employer, and, and I want to step up to the challenge. So I, I don't think it's one or the other. Um, I think it's, it's a mix of both approaches. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, we definitely heard during the ACA, one of the complaints of small businesses is that they don't have the financial, they don't have the ability right. to negotiate because they're five workers and instead of 500. They can, a 500 person firm can negotiate prices. Do, do you really want to? I, I, I would even, I would even say benefits at a small company. Yeah, I would even say benefits at a small company sometimes are even more important than at larger companies because small employers um, tend to be more connected to their employees um, and their community, and their employees are much more like like their family uh, than than at large. Um, and you're large talking companies. both health and retirement I, I, package. Yeah, I'm going to go to the table now, and I think you all are going to help me respond to what comes up. Michael, I saw you first. Uh, right. Uh, well, thanks. Um, I, I wanted to to ask Red um, to sort of uh, to to unpack for us a couple of nuggets of received wisdom about um, small businesses and their response to uh, to initiatives, government initiatives that, that we keep hearing often from sources that may or may not uh, genuinely represent the viewpoint of small business. And one of them is is something that that we've already touched upon uh, today. And that is the idea that um, the uh, uh, the healthcare mandate is going to suppress employment by because small employers are going to be uh, going to uh, feel an incentive to not breach that that threshold of, of 50 employees, so they're going to go up to 49 and and then stop. Um, and then there's a related one which we have I don't think we have talked about yet today, and that is uh, the minimum wage. And the received wisdom there um, is that uh, if you raise the, the minimum wage to the nine dollars that President Obama has proposed, uh, much less the ten dollars that Tom Harkin has proposed, or the sixteen dollars and fifty cents that it would be if it had tracked productivity gains since 1968, um, then inevitably it's going to result in less hiring, uh, even though uh, we know that um, the evidence from all of the studies of employment effects of minimum wage are, are at, at best equivocal and really uh, uh, most of them show no effect or even um, a, a possibly a positive effect on employment. So um, what do you hear, what do you find uh, in the studies you've done and what do you hear from your constituency on those issues? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, that we found has been most interesting to me over the past four years that I've done this is that small business owners are far more pragmatic than they have been led on to believe. I think there's been a sort of a perpetuation out there that there, as I said before, has sort of been no role that they, you know, that the government has no role. I don't think that they think that, you know, the government should be, you know, slapping them on the back with numerous mandates, but I think they do understand that there is a positive role that the government can play. Um, an interesting point on the minimum wage piece, uh, we, we recently, and, and like I said, all of our, our, our research is actually scientific. So when we poll small business owners, we just don't poll our membership. We actually do a scientific sample. We, we hired out, and, and a lot of times the majority of our polling is done by bipartisan firms. We actually recently asked about minimum wage uh, right after the State of the Union. I don't know if it was because of sort of the point in the State of the Union. Uh, we really thought it was going to come back poorly. Um, and it was the, the first time that we have seen in polls that small business owners um, actually said that they supported a decrease in the minimum wage. We didn't associate a, uh, a price point with it, so we didn't test the President's proposal and we didn't test Senator Harkin's. We sort of just tested the general, do you think it's time for an increase in the minimum wage? So I think, uh, you know, business owners, uh, particularly local business owners, um, 
have their their feet and ears, I like to say, to the ground of of local economies. Uh, consumer demand is is one of the you know, in addition to access capital, the number one thing uh, that we hear all the time. What role can the government play? Um, so I think that I think that uh, small business owners um, are are concerned with this issue uh, of consumer demand, and I I think they do think um, that there are positive steps uh, that that the government can take in sort of increasing increasing that demand. Thanks. Ed? Um, I, I have two questions. Um, the first one is for Rhett, the second is for the panel. Um, the first is within the context of self-employment. Uh, where I see self-employment occurring in the Mississippi Delta is as a, it's a, out of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, an individual is often in a low-wage job, and he or she then goes into business to supplement those wages. And so, um, you know, hauling, you know, hair, braiding, um, selling produce a lot of black farmers will sell produce um so how do we bring the retirement conversation to those individuals that are already you know turning to self-employment to get by that's question number one the second question is about half of the small businesses we finance have already been turned down by a bank or referred directly to us so so we're moving into that access to capital space about 20 percent of those businesses are able to offer some type of retirement um, assistance. You know, what's the policy change either at the federal or state level that we should be pushing so that those businesses, which may struggle to repay the loans that we make, can, you know, offer something to their employees in the reti in, you know, retirement space? Well, I'll start with the first piece and then I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> the second piece. How do I, we unlock capital? Like, I think it's yeah. been in every Aspen Institute. <laughs> Piece. Uh, I, I think you're exactly right. I think uh, in a lot of communities, particularly in very poor communities, the idea of self-entrepreneurship um, and small business and um, all of the things that come along with that is uh, not only uh, part of the American dream, but now a necessity. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of the reasons that we've had a conversation here today, uh, you know, employment is changing. Um, but I, I mean, I think we're even seeing it at professional levels too. We're starting to see, you know, more consultants and things like that. So I just, I think the way that uh, Americans are going to be employed in general, we're seeing a shift. Um, so I think we're going to see more, uh, more and more entrepreneurship coming out of that. Um, not only uh, a lot of it out of necessity, like you said. So I think your point on with that. I think you're right that we have a challenge of of bringing the small business piece into the retirement security conversation. Um, you know, over the course of sort of my career in, you know, politics and working with lots of different communities, the small business community in particular has been the most difficult community that I've worked with to sort of bring to the public policy table. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. <laughs> we should, and we should do more of it, actually. I think um, policymakers and advocates like ourselves should spend more time listening to small business owners. But because they are so busy running their businesses, keeping their doors open, making payroll. Um, it's really hard to get them to think about these issues, which I think, you know, is a good argument in favor of why, you know, maybe some of these responsibilities should, you know, be removed from the employer and there should be, you know, opportunities for the people who work with them. I'm not saying that, it, that employers don't want that because we very much hear that they want to play a part of the benefits conversation to stay competitive. Um, but I think that, like I said, I think it's, it's going to be a myriad of options. Um, but I think uh, you're right to recognize that there's a challenge in bringing their voice into this conversation just because of sort of the constituency of who they are. Can I just push Ed's question back to Nira and Jim if you want to make a comment? So from Ed, what you're basically saying is 20% of the people you already finance come to you with a retirement program. That's right. So annually we survey all the businesses that we finance that are um, current on their loan repayment. and. Um, Twenty percent of those businesses last year offer some type of retirement assistance to their employees for themselves. So, if we pull from the morning conversation to this one, somebody from one of our companies has found a market. You know, somebody has found your client and has gone into partnership with them to get into a savings plan. So. And what is your typical size? Are we talking over 50 or are we talking? Well, so that's the, it was a comment 50. made earlier about the importance of size. Yeah. And it is the larger businesses that we finance that typically are going to be the ones that offer the, the plans. Um, I don't know what the difference in sizes are off the top of my head. So 
Nira or Jim, do you have a reaction to Ed's point that he's he's running a small business portfolio in a very tough part of the country, and at least 20 percent that leaves 80 percent out, but the 20 percent are have found a way to offer a retirement plan. But he's saying, what else could happen to move the 20 percent up? Do you have a reaction? Or to or to bring the 80 percent in? Or, or bring yeah, yeah. excuse me, bring the 20. Change that number from 20% right, right, right. higher, yeah. Bring the 80%, touch the 80%, particularly in the group of self-employed. Have you looked at I mean, so, I, I mean, I really don't have the, uh, the, the magic bullet here. Uh, I guess the question is, is there, for some group of employers, is there a pooling mechanism, a state option, <laughs> like some... <laughs> Something in which they would be happy to help encourage retirement without being without having too much skin in the game. So it's like, I, it's, it's from. Do you have a sense why the eighty percent, the larger amongst the eighty percent, aren't doing? I mean, my sense is that it all comes down to they're not making enough money right. to offer some type of a benefit, basically. Okay. Uh, uh, just, uh, I mean, I think uh, cost is definitely part of it. I think size is an important part. And I know one of the innovative ideas that sort of came out of our last summit was, in, in, in a lot of ways, we hope the healthcare exchanges, which really are supposed to be marketplaces for small businesses, at some point would be able to offer a variety of products. And I know that there's some ERISA challenges for the lawyers in the room. I'm not a lawyer about how that might work. But for small employers who are going to be shopping on this new marketplace, um, if they could also pick up their retirement plan, um, not, only, not only adds convenience, but also offers sort of a pooling mechanism like we've talked about. I mean, it seems to me like we're spending a lot of money investing in the infrastructure, lots of different states doing that. Uh, if there's creative ways to use that system for other products, we might consider that. Well, I mean, I, I guess my comment would be that, that with that group, you know, to me, as we said, it's going to be a challenge probably always uh, getting them to offer. So, again, maybe, you know, again, the best solution is to have them not be in that business. And rather, you know, so where, you know, so where are those workers going to do for retirement in addition to Social Security? And uh, we, don't, we want to have consensus. And I think, I really think that the idea of a, a, some sort of universal saving plan, even you know, with a government match, and again, we can talk about where that money might come from. Uh, it, to me, is really a solution for those very small businesses, uh, which are probably always going to have a problem coming up with the dough uh, to run a retirement plan. Okay, Bob. <clears throat> uh, I love starting, uh, Jim, just where you ended. I, um, I guess the the title of this, the focus was kind of business and small business and retirement savings. I want to come back to, I think, the question you posed of why have startups, or at least the job creation from startups, declined? Uh, and I, will, I would argue, I can't prove, that it's the uh, wiping out of family savings. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, because of the housing crisis, because of the downturn. Um, but, but the data, I think, are important. So the National Bureau of Economic Research has done a series of studies which has found that all the net new job creation in the U.S. in the last 30 years has come from new and young businesses, not large, not small. Um, but it has gone from a high of 3.6 million a year to a current low over the last few years of 2.2 million a year. I think, you know, most particularly most self-employment, but most startups are financed out of personal savings, savings of friends, family, and associates. They don't even get to the bank, which isn't going to lend anyway <laughs> at that point. Um, and, they don't, and most of them aren't big enough to get access venture capital. Um, and the housing crisis um, and our policies, where we don't incent the bottom 60 plus percent of families to save uh, has also hurt that. So, um, you know, I love the title of the, f the first session, which I hope we keep, you know, throughout this. But I really do believe that household savings are a source of macroeconomic growth and that if we can ride that banner, um, maybe we can find a way to create some bipartisan consensus. So I mean, it's not so much a question, but I do think this, 
embracing the whole kind of lifetime savings and that it's not retirement savings versus business savings versus college savings versus emergency savings but more a continuum and that you have to save your whole life to get to a secure retirement and also to generate the businesses and jobs that we'll need. Reaction? Great. Uh, one, one of the things you know, I, I write about and um, you know, a few of the scholars at AEI uh, have come up with is that you know, we, you know, we have a tax code uh, which doesn't encourage savings, which penalizes saving. Uh, that if, if we're going to have actual tax reform, and we've talked a lot about you know, broadening the base and, and lowering the rate, well, I mean, I'd like to look at it a little bit differently and think about what, you know, what are we really trying to accomplish uh, with the tax code. And one of the things I would like to accomplish is the tax code uh, that, that didn't penalize savings and investment. Um, you know, we, you know, we can debate about the, you know, the exact impact of corporate taxes and dividend taxes and capital gains taxes. Uh, but I think we talk about the math. What I think the math says is right now the current tax code uh, does, not, does not encourage savings. Uh, it encourages consumption. So why should we be amazingly surprised that we currently have not enough savings, but maybe too much consumption? Yeah. Um, well, I think we probably have yeah. too little of either. <laughs> I mean, too my view is that we probably have savings. too little of either right now at, at this current moment, but generally of either consumption or savings. I guess I, I guess I, I, my earlier comment I think was sort of trying to react to this idea, which is that uh, perhaps I think this maybe it's just a corollary to what you're saying, which is that the less in, the less institutional support people have for a variety of accidents that can occur to them can occur uh, the more they're going to cling to their savings or other things. I mean, this is the big problem with China, right? One of the big problems we have in the world right now is that because there aren't systems of insurance for healthcare and other, <laughs> other, and other things that can happen to humans, the Chinese savings rate is just too high and they're not consuming enough for the global marketplace, including the U.S., et cetera. So they're not, they're not, they're not encouraging, they're discouraging growth on some level. So, um, so I do think there's, you know, a, people react to the society they live in and make decisions that are rational decisions for them. And people are going to, people, people aren't going to take risks when taking a risk is such a huge problem for them. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's my response to the issue of startups as well. I want to note that we've got some areas of consensus here. <laughs> At least between so us and people in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. I am not for dismantling the savings. We've got uh, we've got Jim not dismantling and talking about uh, universal savings accounts with government matches. We've got Nira agreeing that I, I'm all for household savings, savings and macroeconomic growth. It's, it's pretty powerful. I'm going to go to a couple of people that haven't spoken, and I'm going to see you. But John, where? Sure. Um, first of all, Lisa, thank you, and thank you for the whole panel. Um, you know, one of one of maybe the most favorite things about my job is I actually get to go out and visit with small business clients and prospects just about every week, um, and they really are the absolute backbone of America. And it's and it's you know, if you ever want to bounce in your step, you know, come 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 with me on one of those visits. These folks are absolutely fabulous. Um, but you know, you know, a couple of thoughts from, from, from those experiences that might be relevant. Um, one, you know, I've had a number of those clients really kind of talk to me about this paradox of being a small business owner today. And you know, on one hand, it should never be easier than right now to be a small business owner. If you think about the digital revolution, if you think about the information age, you know, communications, access to information, ability to put forth you know, a, a, a professional presence, you know, all of those things anyone can now do with, you know, sort of laser quality, uh, you know, sort of color, technicolor uh, capabilities from, from a desktop where, you know, gosh, even 10 years ago, having that kind of information and that kind of, uh, you know, sort of presence would, 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 would be really difficult. But at the <laughs> very same time, you know, I also have those clients tell me it's also <clears throat> never been harder. And a lot of these folks have been in business for years. And, and, and there's two things that I think they really cite. Um, one is just the variability of their revenue streams through this economic downturn. And if you think about it, you know, if you're a small business owner losing one account 
you know, losing one, one sale, you know, having one downturn, you know, where your plant is shut or your shop is shut for, you know, a week or two because of, uh, you know, of a storm. And, and, and so what, what, what I hear a lot of them talk about is a real reluctance to engage in anything that looks like fixed costs. And I think that fits very nicely into what we're talking about here with, with added mandates, added, you know, sort of asks of these business owners. I don't think they have any problem with those asks per se. I think they have an allergic reaction to anything that all of a sudden makes them feel like, gosh, if I now next year have a down year, am I below the low water mark and will my business literally survive? So I think that's, you know, that's one of them. The other thing I hear a lot about, and, and please don't, don't take this as an anti-regulatory comment, it's not, but it is the, the, the cumulative and what I would term sort of disjointed level of regulation that many of these small business owners face. So I visited a client in Houston uh, three months ago, and this is a great story. A guy laid off from his job um, doing machine uh, uh, sort of fabrication, a valve a fabri a fa fabrication for oil drilling platforms. Started his own business. I mean, bought a lathe, started cutting steel. And, you know, he told me that, you know, between state, local, and federal agencies, for him to get started in his business, there were over 30 to 40 groups that he had to coordinate with. Now, by the way, I have not audited that, so please no one <laughs> quote me on that. I didn't go back and, and sort of check that, but I, but, but, I, but I believe on the face of it that it's, that it's directionally right. And yet when you look at his office, you know, he's got uh, 12 or 15 <laughs> machinists working for him, and his sister is his bookkeeper, and that's it. And by the way, would describe his full-time job, 80 to 100 hours a week, is, is making machine parts. And so the idea of all of a sudden dealing now with 40 or 50 groups, oh, all of which we would say are good things, like OSHA. Who's going to argue that OSHA should be coming in and making sure that the, you know, that the, the employees are, are safe and the workplace is right, and, and, and sort of right on down the line? But I think there is this notion of cumulative impact. And I think, Rhett, you mentioned this before when you started to to describe a little bit what, the, you know, what these offices look like, where I think the capacity of these small business owners to actually take on and think about more, besides just running their day-to-day -day business, is very, very low. So thought, thought number one. Thought, thought number two is, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about capital and access to capital. And again, I think this is one of these places where we really have to de-average to get to the true story. And what is interesting, and I think, you know, Bob, this comes back to your point from earlier, for those companies that are going concerns, where they have some equity built in, they've got a, you know, a client roster, they've got, you know, maybe a year or two of business performance, the, the competition to provide those people with loans has never been fiercer. And you can see it in the pricing data, and I, I can tell you from firsthand experience, you know, every one of those deals is, is, is sort of heavily contested. What is, I think, absolutely true is if you are trying to get started, there is, you know, there is no help out there. Um, and that's not, I would argue, a bank lending thing because capital is not the same as equity. I think it is how do you find equity to start these, these small businesses with? And I think it's exactly to the savings point and to the friends and family point. And, and the, you know, the points that have been raised are exactly right. Most of the small business owners I meet with started their business by mortgaging their home, borrowing from friends and family, in the case of this fellow from Houston, using his severance payment that he got from being laid off from his job. Maybe the severance industry is still pretty good right now, but I don't think any of those other sources of capital are, are really particularly good. And so I think, I think really thinking about how do we get more small-scale capital, equity, not loans, equity into the system, would I think be a great way to think about how do you encourage small business development. So can I react to one thing, the regulatory impact issue? Um, so I think that is a, is a really important issue. And I think that essentially how, how levels of regulation interact with each other at the state and local level, particularly at the local level, um, because, you know, just being in a city, you can have different levels of interaction. And I think it's really an a kind of, uh, you know, we've, we've started to do work in, in that space at CAP on trying to rationalize some of these interactions on regulation. And what I've been really struck by is how disinterested people are in the business community, in the big business community in Washington about these sets of issues because they really think it impacts 
small businesses and not them because they have an empl they have an operation to deal with these variations <laughs> of regulation and like they have it covered. So they much rather fight over new federal regulations than do anything about harmonizing regulations at the state and local yeah. level with the federal level. And you know, I it's like a it's it's an in total I don't understand why the so-called small business groups at the national level that are that you really kind of a concern into a conservative direction don't take these issues on small business majority obviously would but but like other I, it's it's a kind of weird issue in the political economy of Washington that people spend all their time taking on take quote on taking on new federal regulations um, that they also have people can deal with versus dealing with this issue which in many parts of the country it's just going to be it is you could just it is an issue of efficiency that there's not a lot of consideration even between the state and local yeah. operate governments about how regulations regulations that by themselves make a lot of sense but reinforce or negatively impact each other and it seems to me like that would be a perfectly good thing to do um, and for you know business to support but i've seen very little I've seen very little policy advocacy in that space at any level. Well, and 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 Nira, I would add. I mean, I, you know, I think coordination between the regulations would be yeah. delightful. Would be I fair. think even a clearinghouse. Yeah. That allowed you to say, I don't, because because you know, in this one, in, you know, one person's uh, you know sort of experience, the hardest part was figuring out who to talk to. Yeah. You know, how do I right. know but that? Right. But also, the it's just is like the right they're going to be. If you're doing, there's going to be examples where if you <coughs> follow the state regulation, the city regulation should yeah. be like you should get a pet, like a waiver. You yeah. know, I mean, that's going to. But it's it's a it's but it's odd to me. Like even the local chambers of commerce have not. It's a it's a it's an issue that I I don't understand why, is it doesn't they don't make more of a big deal about. Good. Um, sticking with my rule of those whose voices we haven't heard, uh, I'm going to come to Bob and then Lata, and then I'm going to come to Eugene. So. Um, Nedra earlier was talking about companies, I think she said, are pretty wealthy. Mm -hmm. There was references, uh, reference made to $2 trillion parked offshore and the need for a corporation to provide paid, uh, more paid leave. Uh, others have said small business is just trying to keep the doors open and struggling to repay. Those are very different pictures, uh, and I'm trying to reconcile them. Maybe Nedra's comments were focused solely on large business, but I'm also thinking as to whether competitive market forces today operate against increased benefits, and therefore whether uh, government mandate <coughs> or policy direction is necessary if we want to pack more benefits uh, into <coughs> the employed, uh, into the workplace. Uh, and also just an observation, and that is uh, when I have changed jobs, uh, I know that there are benefit packages there, but I've never really been very adroit at examining them or weighing whether I should go one place or another because the benefit package is better. Most of my focus has been on whatever the identified salary level was, and the other things sort of went along for the ride. And so I wonder whether, again, market forces and a lack of salience and ability to compare benefits uh, operates to mean that if we want uh, market forces to, to press for better benefits to be included, that's not going to happen. And it really does require uh, government to uh, be more active. And so in, in the larger question, it's, it's sort of what model works best? Is this a sort of thing where, where an enhanced welfare state is necessary to build in more financial security in the workplace? Uh, 
uh, or is there some way to uh, get competitive market forces uh, to operate more effectively in this in this space? So uh, I should just clarify. I mean, when I made my comment, I was talking about uh, I was talking about large employers. I mean, it's the large employers that have the cash on the sidelines, not small business. Um, I did, I think we do have experience with tight labor markets. Uh, at least for some firms within tight labor markets, uh, not only salary but benefits increase. Um, you know, the challenge we have is that we haven't really had a tight labor market in, in quite some time. And so that was the point I was kind of trying to make. I don't, I don't see, uh, you know, I, I'm a progressive, but I have a preference always for the market producing a good if it can. Um, I'm just, I don't see any... Uh, I mean, we don't. We're we are not likely to face a tight labor market for any you know seven <laughs> years. So, and that's that's optimistic. So, um, not even a, that's like a normal labor market, not really even tight. So, from my perspective, I think it's a little hard to imagine, um, you know, the benefits associated with a basic middle class quality of life existing unless they come from external policy guidelines, in which case, you know, the truth is that all employers within the U.S. have to deal with them. You could have a, you know, you could have a do what we did in healthcare and have a small business cutoff or something. Um, but uh, I think the challenge, I mean, I'm more, I'm, I'm anxious about small businesses and the loss and the fact that they, they're not offering this. But I think we should all be anxious that larger employers, well, the big, one of the biggest changes in healthcare is the erosion of healthcare benefits amongst large employers, which has been taking place not you know one or two years in response to the Affordable Care Act, but over the last 12 years. Jim or Rhett, do you have a reaction to this question about the reweighting again of if the small businesses or large ones can't carry the load, push more to to Public solutions, right? Well, <clears throat> I use one of my favorite, like, uh, like McKinsey research phrases. You know, uh, maximum competitive intensity. That's a good. <laughs> you know, repeat after me. I'm there's a the maximum competitive intensity. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll they'll do different things. Uh, obviously, I think we did at, at a much higher labor market, and I and heavens, I hope it's I hope it's not seven years. I, I don't think it has to be seven years. Uh, it might be seven years. It might be uh, it might be longer. Uh, I, 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 I'm dubious about certainly putting more mandates on small business, and I know large business. I know we talk about, uh, you know, that they have all this cash laying around. Well, all that cash laying around looks great as long as things are good. But I think one reason you see all that cash laying around, may, and maybe one reason why we don't we've seen this decline in startups is just just a general the aftermath of the financial crisis and just a, a lack of animal spirits and risk taking. Uh, you know what's going to be the next blow up? Uh, you know, every we've had a, we have, we've had a financial shock in this country every five or six years for the past thirty years, which means the last one was in two thousand and seven, which means we're just about due for another one now. I don't know if, if it's going to be that, if it's going to be the euro crisis. So, so I think as as a CEO might see it, yes, I have all I have all this cash, but I have all this cash for a good reason, and not necessarily just because I want to you know have this big cash pile for and, and not give workers benefits. Lata. Thanks. Um, so one quick comment and then a question. The comment relates to something, Brett, you mentioned that you're concerned about not enough young people starting mm -hmm. businesses. And I would just, I think it's worth calling out also the concern around ensuring that diverse individuals of all sorts of people of color, women, veterans, and so on, right, also have the access to capital that they need to start those businesses. Um, my question relates, I very much agree. Yeah. To mm -hmm. the, um, the comments about the commitment of small businesses to the wages plus um, sort of issue. And, I would argue right, that there is a movement afoot um, called benefit corporations mm -hmm. in terms of small businesses actually being very committed to just that in addition to a whole host of other things. So, and in fact, the governor of Delaware next week is going to sign into legislation right, the ability of, uh, of corporations to not operate just as a single purpose uh, entity in terms of pursuing a profit, but also pursuing social good uh, and not risking lawsuits from their shareholders. Um, so I'm just wondering from, if the panelists see any uh, promise in that from the workers' perspective. So I actually don't know, I, I mean, we've studied, others would know, you probably know more than I do, about the 
attribution of benefit corporations, uh, of the attributes of the benefits for their employees for benefit corporations. Um, so, you know, B Corps can pursue a, a social good. I just, I would assume that perhaps they are better at allocating <laughs> resources to employees, but I don't know that they are. Um, so that's, that's, you know, let me know if I'm, if, we, if someone has that knowledge. You know, I do think, uh, I do think encouraging, and someone mentioned this earlier in the earlier panel, <coughs> encouraging new forms of employee relationships, employees, you know, share and sharing in profits, profit sharing plans, ESOPs, other things, I think are really uh, interesting and important and maybe new ways in which we can drive towards some of these issues. Um, I also, uh, I don't think that, I mean, I'm, I'm not naive enough to think that they will grow to a level in a short period of time that will solve all the challenges we have about for, you know, the promise of the American dream for middle class families. But I do think that they are, they offer a potential uh, real opportunity. And in some ways, you know, I think uh, profit sharing plans, you know, really raise the question as to why other companies aren't more along those lines with that structure, without that structure. Yeah, I, I just have one one sort of comment as it relates to B Corps. I think it's very exciting. And I think, you know, over the past few years, we have seen some movement in sort of the local living economy trends, sustainable. And when I say sustainable, I just don't mean green, but sort of broad sustainable. And I think we're starting to see some of that pick up. And, and some of that is related to government making investment in some of those areas. Uh, I think we have a potential political problem. And, and actually, when when you sort of shared the history of your company, I know that both I and Kathleen were sort of taken back. We we're like, oh, that was cool. We had no idea. More companies like yours that are mainstream companies need to start talking about becoming B Corps. And I think that's the political challenge we face because a lot of the companies that are out there, even though there's some mainstream, a lot of them are like hiking companies. And like, yeah. you know, they're sort of associated with like green hippie liberals and that sort of thing. And the only way that you can be socially conscious is to be that way. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I think it's very exciting. I think it's possible. I think it's something we should be investing in and thinking about. I think it uh, has the potential for for bipartisan um, support. I just sort of raise that as, you know, sort of a status of where things are and some of the pushback I get uh, from some of those, you know, businesses when we when we do work with them. Uh, Jean, and then I'll come to you, Yvette. And I see Kathleen, and we're coming to the end of this session. So, so I have a question, and then I'll, I'll give an example to try to prove a point. I really wonder how much a very simplified retirement option is a part of this bigger problem for small businesses. I understand the problem of being regulated across the board by 20 different agencies and stuff like that. But my own experience partly is being self-employed for a brief period of time and then actually building two charities. Now they weren't small businesses, but they had a lot of the same issues, starting up two charities. Is actually I had more problem when I was self-employed and that's mainly because at the time I got into a bunch of options. So I got into this world where people said, you need to have people, people younger people won't even know this, but one time, you were told that the ideal way to set up something if you're self-employed was to have a have a money purchase plan and a uh, and a profit sharing plan because they give you maximum flexibility. And then there are all these options you consider. And all of a sudden, I had to fill out 5,500 tax forms, and it was it was actually I was probably stupid to go that route, but but it supposedly gave me maximum flexibility. When I set up these two charities, I mean I had, I had a lot of problems figuring out how to get rent for the people. The biggest problem, by far the biggest problem in terms of distributing benefits and even thinking what to do is health insurance. It's not just getting it for small employees, but you've got one person who's got, already got health insurance from a spouse, you've got another person who's over 65, you've got a young person, and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out some way to fairly distribute those benefits, because you actually do figure out the cost of those benefits per person. That was very complex, but, but, but for retirement, and I'm, I'm not, I don't like the plan we had, because it wasn't really that generous, but we just adopted a simple plan, and there was nothing to it. You know, yeah, there was 3% of, of wages we had to put aside, and you, we could debate whether employers want to do that in a mandate or an almost mandate or stuff like that. So my, my question is, is if we really simplified the retirement options, you know, get rid of, make it really simple, the discrimination rules, you put in some minimum and you're done, and so on and so forth, 
is retirement really a major, you try to get more money retirement solution, is that really one of the major problems of this small business community in dealing with this, this what we should have sympathy for them, in dealing with this broad regulatory, pro, broad, broader regulatory uh, apparatus that they, apparatus they have to deal with? Reactions to the change? Well, I think there's one piece that we haven't talked about, at least on the small employer side. I mean, I always tell people when we talk about public policy, small business owners don't get, don't wake up in the morning and think about the EPA. I get calls all the time like, you know, do you think a small business owner, do they, do they think about this? And, and really they don't. Um, you know, like I said, they're thinking about keeping their doors open. I think the, the piece that we haven't examined here is a little bit of the employee aspect with small businesses. And um, I partially relate this to our experience. We're incorporated as a 501c3. And when I started with the organization, we had three people. We now have 26. And we have yet to sort of figure out our retirement plan. Um, <laughs> and let me tell you why. It's because it, and, and our, our CEO who founded our organization is like the most amazing, responsive guy. He really, truly is. And he really cares about us. And he pays us all well and all the above. No one has asked for a retirement plan. Not one of our 26 employees. Um, and it was just until after I uh, had this conversation uh, when I was at Y that I went back and said, oh, we need to start thinking about this. And then I sort of started talking to some people and some people said, yeah, that would be nice. So, you know, why I think the, the employer piece is important and I think employers do want to play a role in that. I think also, uh, particularly in the small business piece, um, employees have to go to their employers and also say that, you know, yes, this benefit is important to us and we are thinking about our retirement. And I think, you know, with older employees, obviously that's something they're thinking about, but we face the same issue we faced in healthcare, the 28-year-old guy, me, who, uh, you know, would rather have that extra money in his paycheck uh, rather than uh, put away for the long haul. Well, I mean, what you're arguing is that sort of they'll, they'll never do it because if they don't do it now, when probably young people... You know, I'm not even sure this was a real poll, but you know, they, more young people believe you know, there would be, you know, there were aliens and they believe Social Security. So I think for young people, there's certainly, <laughs> I, I don't think anyone's counting on it. So if you think average 20 something, if you said, are you counting on Social Security? No. They pro I, I, I would guess that that's probably a belief. And yet they still won't go to their employer, demand something. That means they say they're, they're never going to unless they're, you know, nudged into already automatically being in that plan. I hear vote for nudge. <laughs> vote yeah. for the nudge. Right. Yvette. Yes, I just wanted to stay on this notion that Jim introduced of the mindset of the young generation and small business creation into the future with the shocks over five to six years, but also either direct experience or watching their parents through corporate downsizing or outsourcing or, uh, you know, student debt for their, uh, their uh, siblings or themselves, et cetera. And the parallel we've seen in investments is that generation is actually as conservative as the folks who lived through the Great Depression, which obviously has real concern for their long-term retirement prospects and growth if, for, you know, in their 20s, we can't convince them to have a portfolio that's diversified. Um, so I was just curious around are there any policies or things that we can do to encourage them to be more risk-taking, not only in their investments for their retirement, but also in new business creation. Hmm. Well, well, I, I, think, again, I, think that's a, I think that is a huge issue, that sort of, that sort of now sort of innate caution, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's starting a business or, 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 be, or being in stocks. You're right. I mean, right. after the Great Depression, I mean, can't blame them. I mean, the S&P 500 didn't return to its old levels didn't from do much. 1929 <laughs> to about 1956. Right. So that was, that was a bit of a fallow period uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the stocks. Uh, so you understand, I, and, I, I, and what doesn't make it easier is that you also have a lot more, I mean, I think people, you know, long term, they should be in, you know, publicly traded uh, stocks. Again, I am not a registered investment advisor. <laughs> this is not specific. There are no guarantees of, you know, past results. No but we have them in the room. <laughs> so. But, but that, that being said, you also have, you have more companies going private. There are just fewer equities out there for people to So I think if you talk about regulatory reform, um, I'm not sure if it's a reform of Sarbanes-Oxley, make it easier for companies to go public, because even if, even if they get past that sort of innate, you know, uh, caution, uh, there just aren't as many publicly traded companies to be involved in. And you can also talk about the volatility uh, from, from, uh, from, high, from high frequency trading. Also, I mean, who wants to be in, market, in a market when you think it could go down 1,000 points because of you know, the infamous you know, fat finger mistake? So. I'm going to um, remind you to ask Eric's boss, Janet Merguia, that question tomorrow because she's starting us off tomorrow with a kind of next generation, can it live better? 
uh, truly mobility thing, and I think it, it is an interesting piece of this. We're at the five minute mark, maybe four minute mark. There's a lovely lunch waiting. There are hills to climb. Uh, so I'm gonna do a lightning round of questions all together and then ask you guys to close us out. So Kathleen and- Well, I'll just uh, ask, I'll, I'll be very quick. So I was just curious about the role of Walmart um, for small businesses, because a lot of, you know, if you were in a small town, you'd start a, a business, you'd have a retail. Interesting. And when I think of all the small businesses that I used to see growing up yep. many years ago, um, <laughs> they've all been taken over by one but, large yeah, big box stores. And those were easy to start, right. they were needed, and people could do that. So, right. yeah, I love that you're nodding, but that would be my, one of my questions. And yeah. if you really want to start, if you think small business is important, what do you do with large trucks? I know Ed has a reaction to that too. Okay, Walmart, Maureen. Oh, well, so my, my comment was sort of, I, I feel like I've been hearing a little bit of an association of, um, like there's this, we can either raise wages or we can have benefits, but I, you know, I feel like in the, work that I've been doing looking at what's going on for low-income people, you know, the lack of benefits is associated also with low wages, right. irregular hours, all of these kinds of things. Um, so, so you know, so I'm sort of thinking about, well, what's the no friction easy thing to do? So I have to go back to the raise the minimum wage point, which is easy. It's easy to understand. People understand. I was interested that even your small business folks said, yeah, maybe it's time to raise the minimum wage. Um, certainly the research shows that it's not a job killer, David Newmark aside. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and in, you know, sort of, you brought up Walmart and retail, you could say the same thing with Darden Foods and restaurants, right? I mean, you have small restaurants and then you have Olive Garden, Red Lobster, et cetera, et cetera, everywhere. Um, you know, there's lots of restaurants that are small restaurants where they pay their servers more than two thirteen an hour, where they pay their dishwashers more than seven twenty five an hour and they do just fine. So uh, you know, and there are states that have these higher minimums and they do just fine. So I, I you know, I guess sort of I keep going back to, well, can we at least push push on that? And then maybe people could save a little bit more mm -hmm. if they had higher wages. Good. Kevin, last one? No, I was just gonna say real quickly, I, I think Brett triggered the memory. Um, when I was twenty seven in Washington DC a senior associate at the National Education Association. I remember vividly now that I was with the human resources uh, manager, and they were talking about a 401k plan, a really generous match uh, from the employer. And my mindset at that time was, explain this one to me again. So you're going to take X amount of money from my check, and you're going to take it away from me, and you're taking cash from my pocket. And I was like, you're crazy. There's no way I'm going to participate in that. And that is, that obviously comes from a household where we had no financial understanding and, you know, I had no financial background. And that's why the behavioral nudge uh, is mm -hmm. critical for the success, whatever type of program it is, you know, whatever instrument. But that's why it's so critical for folks because you take um, advantage of the inertia that currently exists and the, the wonderful gift of compounding interest and wonderful wise investments will pay off for folks in the long run. Panel, the nudge, the minimum wage, and Walmart. Any reactions? <laughs> uh, again, do not give do not give up hope on the nudge that, you know, that, that I realize right now anything that's, again, sounds like a mandate, sounds like another government regulation is, is not going to be very popular among Republicans in Congress. Uh, I just don't think that's always going to be the case. I, I, I really just think the economic logic and the simplicity uh, of this idea um, is so powerful and, and it being such a huge problem uh, that, it's, that it's a way of getting at that problem, uh, you, know, without, you know, without all the stuff that Republicans probably hate more than a nudge, which would be, you know, higher taxes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, we, I think that the nudge is right. And I think of my own experience, I worked my, when I was in my late twenties, I worked in the federal government and they basically give you a super nudge and it works perfectly well. And I'm glad I did that at the time. Uh, on the minimum wage, um, you know, I think this conversation was, you know, deemed to be about benefits. So, but I agree, <laughs> I mean, I strongly agree that the minimum wage itself is, out of step and would be an additional way in which you could get more money in the hands of people who will actually go spend it on those small businesses who we want to 
create new startups. So, um, so I think it's a you know we have no evidence that it hurts. You know, for every for if anything, it's neutral or positive, as I said earlier. So, um, but you know, I'd, I'd say the minimum wage is one of the things that has a little less bipartisan support than, say, automatic enrollment. So, um, pair that with the capital gains <laughs> tax cut. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, the deals that are being cut here. Okay. No. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, but I, I, I agree uh, with that. And, um, and then, you know, I do think we, you know, the whole structure of consumption in the U.S., which has been buying so many, you know, it's fascinating to me that uh, Europe has so much export and so little incoming from China, and the U.S. has so much incoming from China. Just a fascinating difference in our tastes that Europe purchases so less, so much less from Chinese manufacturers of often useless toys, but um, than the U.S. I think, and that's a big. That's just the nature of what we have to struggle with. Right. Final say. Yeah. So I think uh, yes on the nudge. I you know I don't have the answer uh, about Walmart. I I think it's exactly right. I mean one of the things we hear over and over from small businesses is the competition, particularly in small towns where Walmart comes in and just completely you know you can get your hammer for two dollars versus the three dollars you could get it at the the local hardware store and and that is something I think we need to grapple with. One of the interesting conversations that's come out of this is uh, around Medicaid expansion because um, all of you have probably you know been reading about you know how much Walmart's employees take advantage of the the public system, um, and you know we have seen as of late more support for small businesses to actually raise you know expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act for that very reason because their employees fall in line there, but also because they feel like their their large competitors are cheating the system by paying them low wages, cutting their hours down, and then forcing them to, uh, to you know, take advantage of, of the okay. public system. So uh, I think uh, that that's something we definitely need to talk about as part of this conversation. The last thing I just wanted to leave folks with, because I think it's something that we have to struggle with that small business majority is, I think the conversation around good jobs is a really important one, and we need to have it. Um, and I think there's a lot of agreement here, but I also think um, as we talk about low-income communities and pathways out of poverty, I really do believe that entrepreneurship is a pathway out of poverty. And I, I don't think enough, uh, enough people on both sides of the mm -hmm. aisle have talked about that. So there are lots of people who want good jobs. We should create those good jobs. We should have responsible employers. But we also, um, you know, it, it's the whole teach a, teach a man to fish sort of thing. We also should uh, have a, a conversation about how we can help low-income individuals from multiple backgrounds also become entrepreneurs and, and create those high-tech startups. Great. You're going to have lots of lunch, friends. Uh, may I please have you join me in thanking Brett and Nira and Jim. <laughs> Thank you so much.